Muster the Rohirrim, we've got a whole new supplement and some juicy terrain kits as war comes to Rohan. Welcome to Self Self Gaming, my name is Locke Linton Keen, and today we are diving headfirst into War in Rohan, the new supplement for the Middle Earth strategy battle game. We've got a big juicy book to have a look through with a lot of amazing content, as well as some incredible new terrain kits that have been released alongside the supplement. We've got Rohan Houses, Rohan Watchtowers, and a Rohan Stronghold, which is of course just lots of Rohan Watchtowers and Houses, uh, so it's going to be absolutely awesome. The new kits are amazing for all of you who are watching must know by now, I mean you should if you're watching this video, I am a huge Rohan boy, I love me some horse lords, uh, and all of the conflicts that have taken place in Rohan and throughout Rohan's early history and of course during the War of the Ring are some of my favourite conflicts and events probably in all of Middle Earth, I absolutely love Rohan, uh, so I am absolutely super excited. Uh, the new supplement looks absolutely amazing, it's kind of very in the vein of Gondor at War, we've got an amazing narrative campaign, a whole bunch of legendary legions and Lots of new profiles and kind of formats for existing armies. There's even a battle company in this book, which is just so cool. Uh, and these terrain kits are absolutely stunning. But before we dive into the big book, let's check these out and have a bit of a look because they are phenomenal. Now, as you can see, there are three kits here. We've got a Rohan House, a Rohan Watchtower and Palisades kit, and then the Stronghold. Now, I guess the first thing to kind of commend Games Workshop on is this box right here. This is a big uh, limited release bundle, which I think is already sold out in the UK. Hopefully, if you know, seeming as it's sold quite well, it might come back in the future, as we've seen, uh, you know, just at uh, Warhammer Fest, no, Throne of Skulls, just uh, this weekend, uh, we got some announcement that some uh, the, the card profile cards are coming back because they sold so well, so maybe this might come back at the moment. It is sold out in a lot of territories, uh, but it is a big, big bundle. I think in here we get six Rohan houses and two Rohan watchtowers, which are these guys over here, and you save, I think, about 25 to 30% on the price of buying them individually, uh, depending on the currency that you're working in, which is just amazing. We, you know, kind of in the past, there's been the whole, like, you know, one-click bundles that don't actually give you any discounts with Games Workshop, but this is an awesome direction, uh, and, uh, and I'm just super amped. So, uh, yeah, I'm mind blown to have this sent to me by Games Workshop. It is uh, yeah, hugely amazing. Thank you so much to everyone at Warhammer a community and the team for sending all of this loot out to me. We're going to be doing some amazing videos on all this terrain uh, in the coming weeks, but that's enough about the stronghold. Let's have a look at the actual components, which are our two kits that make up the bulk of the new terrain range. So first up, we're going to go for our, a, a juicy Rohan house. Uh, this is an awesome kit. Uh, I am so excited to get building with these. Let's have a look at what we get inside. Now, with all of these new terrain kits, they are a single sprue that is often repeated. In the house, we get two sets of the same sprue, and in the watchtower, you get, I think, four. Uh, and uh, basically, you get all your components across the two sprues, and obviously, you get a bit, a bit of repetition. So you can see here, we've got one roof panel, we've got half the wall panels we need, half the door, half of the kind of uh, crests and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so, you know, when you combine them together, you get a enough to make one house. Now, it does come with some instructions, which is quite handy because it's a little daunting looking at all of the plastic, and it shows you the way that the walls fit together, uh, it shows you the way that the kind of roofing components work together, and gives you a general outlay on, on the main sort of way that the kit is intended to be built. But, let me tell you, that is not all, ladies and gentlemen. These kits are ridiculous. The way that the walls are designed, the way that the timber structures, you've got these kind of wall panels and then interlocking beams and things, you can just keep 
keep clicking stuff together and building bigger structures, longer roofs, more walls, extra levels. Uh, we saw in the Warhammer community article that came out earlier this week what you can do by building a whole bunch of kits to make kind of like a big mead hall. It sort of looks a bit like Metacell. So there is some amazing flexibility. You can position the kind of little adjunct extra anterior building components like on different sides. You can make multiple of them or not have them at all. Move roof components up to the top of the building. So there is a lot of flexibility to really kit out a fantastic looking Rohan village. Now, it's not just buildings. We've got roofs, we've got walls, we've got doors, but there's also a bit of kind of village life. You get a barrel on each sprue, so I think that's yeah, that's two barrels, uh, and then you get a whole bunch of really nice fences, which are really lovely and, and really well designed. And I guess that's kind of a big point to touch on. All of these kits are so movie authentic. You guys know I, I've built two massive Edoras boards myself. I'm very familiar with the exact architecture. I have uh, a quite a good relationship with the person who spent a lot of time designing these actual sets when they were being made in uh, the late 90s, and I've picked his brain a lot about the particular architectural details on the build. Buildings. So I'm very, very familiar with the way that these buildings should look, and these are so spot on, it's ridiculous. There's lots of gorgeous iconography, all of the kind of uh, horse crests on the on the heads, which are optional, so not every building looks the same. You don't have to have horse crests on every building. So if you're not even a Middle Earth person, and you just want these buildings for nice Dark Age, kind of Beowulf-style buildings, these are perfect. I'm particularly fond of the gorgeous little sun crest, which we know, uh, and there's a lot of ways you can use these kits to really replicate, particularly the inner city, which is what a lot of these are, are based off, which is the actual structures that were built on Mount Sunday, the filming location, and then all of the kind of outer city was all VFX. But there's, it's yeah, uh, a, a really big shout out to the design team. Um, I can't remember who it was who did these. Rob did tell me. I'll chuck his name up on the screen. These kits are amazing, dude, and I'm aware of kind of how painful it was for you to find the time to make them and get them done for the Middle Earth team. So a big shout out to you because they are stunning. Well done, dude. Great design, great like sprue design from a materials engineering point of view. You've used the space really well, crammed a lot in. Uh, and yeah, the, the flexibility that these kits give us as gamers is amazing. So thank you and obviously thank you to the Middle Earth team and Rob in particular for making this happen. So uh, awesome, awesome work. The other thing to touch on before we kind of leap off is that all of the walls are double-sided. So you can have interiors for your buildings. There's little doors which you could, you know, splice open with a scalpel. Uh, yeah, you could go absolutely crazy with these. So I'm gonna stop because I could talk about these for an hour, but they are amazing. Now, just before we touch onto the next kit, actually no, let's jump to the next kit. We've got the Palisades. Now, I sort of thought that uh, these things are a little bit pricey. Um, you know, are you getting really a lot of bang for your buck? And then Keith, one of the other guys in the Middle Earth team, uh, kind of gave us a little bit of tidbits the other day on just how much is in these boxes, and it's insane. Let's have a look. So, straight away, we've got four sprues, uh, and you'll notice that there's only one watchtower, so kind of, you know, the big primary horse beam is spread one on each sprue, so that gives you the tower. But look at these walls, they're massive and you get four of them. Basically, it, once you kind of build it all together and you put the gate in, you're essentially getting probably just shy of four feet long of palisade walls. That is awesome. There's two. That's two sprues. So, you know, one, two. That's a lot of walls. That's going to be, you know, you can wall off a whole board. You can make a kind of square, smaller fort. If you get a couple of these kits, you can really make something pretty big. Obviously, they're designed to be these long sections, but I don't see why you couldn't grab a scalpel, slice them, turn them, give them a bit more blend and character. You'd have to get a bit clever with how you uh, modify the flooring and such, but there's definitely some really exciting stuff that you can do here. I know that the gates have got some pretty cool details as well. Uh, you can kind of put them on hinges so that they'll swing, they've got like a little locking bar that drops in behind them, they're absolutely fantastic and of course you get some wonderful instructions with these as well, uh, which is important because they, these sprues are kind of overwhelming, there's a lot of really nice detailed small bits. Uh, we've got ladders, we've got a big bell for mustering the Rohirrim. Cut to bell ringing. Nailed it. So yeah, again, amazing kits. I'm super excited just to like, you know, all the, all the stuff you could build. Yes, you could build Edoras. Uh, I think basically these walls, obviously they're not meant to be the exterior Edoras wall uh, because they're not... Uh, sort of a stone entrenched palisade fortification. The towers aren't the big actual 
gatehouse bastions that are along the wall as well. What they're meant to be, or what they're designed from, is the palisade that runs around Medeseld and the inner court, which is again the elements that were actually physically built, built on the filming location. So uh, yeah, really, really well designed. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the Middle Earth team who's been designing these have, have had reference photos or uh, even set designs uh, from, from Weta and, and from New Line now, because that's where they'd be. So, good lord, it's getting windy outside. So it's, uh, you know, amazing to see how fantastic they look, and they're going to be perfect for replicating the inner city of Metacell, which someone might be attempting, but they're also going to be great for just generic Rohan strongholds or, you know, towns or whatever you want. You could build a fort in the Westfold or something. So lots of exciting stuff there. So, yeah, I mean, the, the kits are amazing, and let's just touch one more little thing, which is, of course, too many boxes, their versatility. If we have a look at this stronghold box, which is this huge multi-pack, like I said, it comes with six houses and two two of the Watchtower kits, you can see here all the different ways that they've combined the kits in, in different kind of components and stacking more components on one kit to make a bigger building, a longer building. They've got two little kind of annexes. You know, there's lots of exciting stuff you can do, uh, whether those annexes are full extra buildings to make a bit of an L shape or they're just a little roof bastion that kind of juts out uh, and creates an extra roof line like we see in so many buildings. Lots of stuff you can do here. Uh, and they look, yeah, they, they just look absolutely amazing. I'll throw up a photo of the uh, Warhammer community display board uh, that the guys built for Warhammer World so you guys can have a look at just how kind of mind-bogglingly awesome these kits really are. Stop talking about the terrain kits, Lockie. I hear you scream. Let's dive into War in Rohan. Now, alongside the supplement, we also had a bunch of re-releases of old models and multi-packs, repacks of existing models. Uh, so we've got, you know, Grimbold and uh, the, uh, what are they called? Helminga's command, uh, that's the Grimbold and the Banner Bearer and all that sort of stuff. There's an Uruk Scout command that has come out with the never before officially released Scout Captain with the two-handed axe, or at least that's the way it's being described. I was pretty sure that you could actually get him in an old Urukai army bundle box, and that's why there's still some around in the market for second hand. But anyway, he's finally been released. No more paying $200 to get the beautiful axe two-handed captain. We all know him from the scene where he, you know, tries to chop Boromir. Exciting stuff. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's really cool to see those models kind of uh, come back. Like, grimbold has been out of stock for ages. Uh, the Royal Guard got multi-packed into a three-pack of cavalry. Yes, there was a slight price increase, but these models haven't increased in price for, like, nearly a decade, I don't think, for the Royal Guard. And now you buy them in a pack of three and you're guaranteed to get one of each pose So I'm happy to pay another 20% to, to get that. It was a nightmare ordering 17 Royal Guard um, There's been kind of a few other repackings as well The Son of Earls are now in a two-pack blister so you get one of each pose again Yes, the price went up a little bit, but you know, they've been $20 or $22 or something for like seven years and you know Inflation is real just because it happened all at once doesn't mean you know, whatever it sucks. Who cares? Models, we have the models, that's good. So really exciting to see. We also had a whole bunch of new models be revealed at Throne of Skulls this weekend, including lots of models, heroes, warriors for Dunland, which is super exciting. Dunland Huskarls, three new Dunland heroes, which we'll dive into in a sec, and Dunland Cavalry. So, uh, really, really awesome stuff. They're not available yet. I don't know when they're going to go on pre-order. My gut feeling is maybe a month, but I have no concrete information on that. Uh, but we do have images, and some people were able to buy them at Throne of Skulls, which is a huge pain in the ass for everyone who doesn't live in the UK. So, let's dive into the supplement itself. Now, overall, it's a phenomenal volume. It's, you know, easily the quality of Gondor at War and Scouring of the Shire. Honestly, I think this is probably the best book they've done so far. Um, um, it's yeah, it's just got so much in it, and it's it's yeah. There's really really great content in here. There are a few things that I'm kind of uh, that just sort of bother me a bit. There's a few missed opportunities, I think, um, and there's a couple of little kind of quirks that irritate me. But on the whole, I'm really really happy with the book. So let's dive in and see what we have now. Obviously. Uh, you know, we've jumped to our table of contents, we can see the main bulk is our scenarios, our campaign, then we've got a whole bunch of armies and legendary legions and, and profiles and things. So just the exact same format as Gondor at War and the previous supplement. Now, of course, it opens with quite a nice little passage on the history of Rohan. Being a Rohan boy, I do like to see this, including the Tale of Years, which is quite nicely transcribed from Appendix 
E, I think, uh, from Return of the King, uh, which talks about, you know, the, the different kings of the mark and, and the evolution of Rohan in a timeline, which is really nice to kind of ground players who aren't super familiar with that stuff. And then we dive straight into the narrative campaign. Now, this campaign is pretty amazing. Just like Gondor at War, it's a linked campaign with heaps of bonuses, and this is all about uh, kind of the Isengard's Rohan conflict during the War of the Rings. So scenario one is the burning of the Westfold. Now this is a reprint of a classic scenario we've been seeing since second edition. Uh, we've got, you know, a Dunlending force with our new profiles and our new models now uh, trying to set fire to Rohan buildings. There's a few really nice little special rules like torching the buildings and putting the fires out. Nothing we haven't seen before, but it's nice to see a really nice comprehensive version of this scenario. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it looks really nice and balanced as well. And it's a great opportunity to get out some of these kits. So loving that. Our second scenario, and this is kind of my biggest gripe with the book, is the Fords of Isen. Scenario 2 and 3 are the first battle of Fords of Isen and the second battle of Fords of Isen. This has been pissing me off for years. The Fords of Isen is not two battles. It's a series of about eight separate conflicts, yes, with two larger kind of landmark conflicts, which are referred to by Tolkien as the first and second battle of the Fords of Isen, but there is so much more than just these conflicts, and with a, you know, 30 scenario long narrative campaign, I was hoping we'd be able to explore the Fords of Isen, which is arguably the most important battle in the history of the War of the Ring, uh, in a little bit more detail, and only having it in the kind of classic rinse and repeat format that we've seen before kind of bugs me and is a bit of a disappointment but in saying that these scenarios are really nice and really well designed to kind of reflect the actual narrative elements of what's happening. You know, we have uh, Theodred sitting in the middle of the eye, in the middle of the river as, uh, you know, Grimbold and the Helmingers are trying to jump in and rescue him before uh, Isengard can kill him. Um, so, you know, obviously Jay's done some great research here. I just think it's a shame that he didn't kind of convey more of the peripheral events. There's so much detail in Unfinished Tales about the exact kind of really broken down sequence by sequence of the exact kind of nature of the conflict you know like we don't see anything about the forts on on the other side of the river island we don't see anything about elf helm doing his kind of awesome flanking maneuvers or anything so it's a shame because there was definitely more potential here but that's okay Loki will just write the bloody scenarios himself and we'll do an awesome campaign but these scenarios are really solid and obviously you know they're, they're tailored to all of the new uh, profiles that we've got access to with the Dunlending models but they're also they're really nicely sized we've got like a good level of participants here, which is really cool. So a couple of quite meaty battles, uh, which is pretty nice, uh, pretty early in the campaign. And of course, you know, the Fords of Eisen, it's going to be a gorgeous board to play on. You're going to have some, some real fun there with the river and stuff. So, you know, I, I do love it. I just wish they'd have done more because the Fords of Eisen is, is like my favorite battle ever. So, meh, 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 meh. It's okay, it's fine. I love it. It's still great. It's still great. Scenario number four is another kind of reprint of a scenario we've seen, I think, five or six times. Uh, this is called Ambush at Night, which is, of course, representing Aemir and his riders hitting uh, Uglux's rabble of orcs with Grishnark at Merry and Pippin. Uh, but the scenario is kind of done in a, a pretty refreshing way, and, and it's, it's a really nicely tailored scenario. Uh, we've got lots of special rules here. You know, Grishnark is trying to, like, get the hobbits, and Merry and Pippin are, you know, doing their thing, trying to sneak away. And we've also got, you know, the, the riders is kind of coming from either sides around this clustered orc camp. So there's lots of juicy stuff in here. And again, we've got, you know, uh, a reasonable kind of uh, showing of orcs and Rohirrim, including one of our new orc profiles, Snaga, who we'll be having a look at in a sec. So even though we've seen this kind of scenario before quite a few times, uh, I still think it's, you know, it's, it's actually a, a really nice inclusion because obviously it needs to be there uh, to, you know, keep the flow of the narrative, which is, you know, this is a linked campaign, but it's also, it's a really tight scenario as well. Overall, the, the quality of the scenario writing in the book is awesome. Now, for something entirely new, we have Grishnark's End. This is a really cool mini scenario. Uh, we've got Treebeard, we've got Grishnark, we've got Merry and Pippin, and they're kind of duking it out in the middle of Fangorn, and uh, obviously Treebeard's trying to squash the Orc Invader, uh, and the Hobbits are probably just trying to keep themselves alive. Uh, there's a couple of really cool special rules. Um, you can uh, like throw stones, they can climb Treebeard, they can wait Treebeard, uh, and there's some really interesting game mechanics here. What this scenario does, if you guys remember uh, the kind of card system that we saw in Gondor at War, we can actually see a little bit of it here on the next scenario, uh, where 
we had a deck of cards play in as well to add extra game mechanics. Uh, so Jay's once again lent into that mechanic and, and it looks like it's kind of like building a bit of a mini game kind of feel, but this one complements uh, existing SBG rules, which is really cool, really cool. Traditionally, we've only seen these mini games be a completely standalone sort of game system with the cards, but this one kind of blends some of the SBG rules with the card system as well. So really cool, looks like it's a lot of fun and something kind of a bit smaller, which complements the, kind of the, the big scenarios we've had so far. Now, complementing that small scenario, we've got another one called the White Wizard. This is a really interesting scenario idea that's all about Gandalf trying to struggle with Saruman for Theoden's mind in the Hall of the Mask. So essentially the way it works is you have Saruman and Gandalf on kind of either end of the board on a, on a stack of cards and uh, Theoden is kind of in this kind of uh, tug of war between the two of them and by playing these different cards and having different effects you're trying to coax Theoden to join your side and uh, when you get Theoden and Gandalf or Theoden and Saruman in the same place uh, you are victorious because you have convinced Theoden to join your side. So a really interesting mechanic and something that again is a, is a nice kind of contrast to break up the big chunks uh, of scenario play so far. And we have the final scenario of kind of phase one which is the Warg attack of course another fantastic conflict. This is uh, scenario we have seen before like a lot of these but it's done pretty cool in a pretty new way. Uh, we've got a nice tight group of Rohan forces stacked full of heroes, Theoden, Legolas, Gimli who starts on his horse as a passenger so we can use those wonderful uh, wonderful models from the old battle games in Middle Earth. Uh, we've got a captain and then Harmer, six riders of Rohan and Strider as well. Uh, so not a whole lot of warriors, it's, it's pretty hero centric and then we have Sharku with 18 wags. We've also got some really cool special rules to help kind of flesh out the narrative of the scenario. Evil automatically wins first turn and heroes can't call any heroics uh, and we've got uh, evil cavalry getting plus one to their fight value in a turn in which they charge which is huge because we've only got uh, riders of Rohan which are fight three or four near Theoden uh, and the wild riders are only fight three as well so that helps give them a little bit of a buff and one of my favorite things is that Harma is also included in this scenario and starts prone in the center of the board with only a single point of might so you've got that kind of chance to relive that moment where Harma gets his head bitten off by a wag maybe we could try and save him this time so some really cool stuff there so up next we enter kind of the second phase of the supplement which is all about Helm's Deep now we've seen this kind of structure before I, I think back to the old Two Towers journey book where we have a series of small scenarios focusing on targeted events of Helm's Deep and then a massive scenario to cover the whole battle we also saw this format in Gondor at War with the Pelennor Fields where we had little chunks happening and then a massive three and a half thousand point battle report uh, and it's exactly the same here let's have a look at how many Helm's Deep scenarios there are. There are Raise the Ladders, Walls of Helm's Deep, Plant the Charges, Deeping Wall is Breached, Oh, I skipped a whole bunch, Retreat to the Hornburg, The Causeway, Fall Back to the Keep, Ride Out, Aemer's Return, and then the Battle of Helm's Deep. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine small scenarios and one massive one to cover Helm's Deep in pretty much as much detail as I think we could have. I'm not going to go through all of them. Essentially, you get the idea that the different scenarios are focusing on the little microcosms within the whole scale of the battle. We have Raise the Ladders, which is all about that early phase where the ladders are going up on the deeping wall. There's no explosive charges. There's just berserkers being flung up onto the wall and the elves and uh, and the Rohirrim kind of holding out as long as they can. In fact, I think it might be purely elves. It is. Uh, it's true to the movie. It's just elves and our three hunters up on the wall with a whole bunch of Uruk. And then we have the Wolves of Helm's Deep, which is stepping through the story a little bit more. The battlements are starting to be overrun, and the Elves and the Defenders have to hold out as long as they can. And then we have Plant the Charges. So this is our third Deeping Wall scenario. And this is where we bring in our bombs, we try and blow a big hole in the wall, and breach our way through. So uh, a lot of kind of really interesting flavor focusing really on the individual moments. Then we've got the Deeping Wall is Breached, our fourth Deeping Wall scenario. I'm sure you guys can imagine what this scenario is all about. We've got, uh, you know, the elves doing their stupid suicidal charge down into the pikes uh, and lots of a really exciting combat and, and it kind of starts to shape up the battle here. The one thing I really like about this is if you go to the effort of building a big Helm's Deep board, you're getting so much awesome playable experience. Uh, so definitely worth it. And of course, all of these scenarios, uh, you know, on real Really interesting size boards. We've got a couple on 4x4s, one on a 1x2, one on a 2x2. Two two. Uh, so, you know, you can really build some cool little small narrative boards that aren't too massive.
massive, you don't have to build a whole fortress, and you can still play some of these really cool scenarios. Then we have Retreat to the Hornburg, which is another Deeping Wall scenario, where uh, the Deeping Wall has been lost and overrun, and our defenders have to bail back. We've got a lot less numbers now, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Haldir, and 12 Warriors of Rohan, and 12 Galadrim, uh, and then we've got a whole bunch of Uruks, 4 Captains, 20 Warriors, 10 and 10, and then 8 Berserkers, but of course they're just coming back on all the time, right? Once they die, they just keep coming back on the board edge, uh, which is absolutely savage. Numbers beyond count. So you got to get out of there, and you got to get out of there fast, and then... Whoop, as all my terrain falls over, we are finally away from the Deeping Wall. We have the Causeway, which is a really cool scenario. Aragorn and Gimli back to back, fighting off for the waves of Urukai trying to get to the door uh, and smash it down. So uh, a really kind of awesome, themey scenario. I wonder if they do the jump. Do they do the jump? No, I think I think they stand there already uh, at, at the beginning. They've already done the the toss me moment, uh, but uh, yeah, lots. Of, like it's a really cool scenario. This is on a one by one. Very very easy for for everyone to do at home. Super super easy stuff. Up next, we're uh, moving into the keep. Fall back to the keep. This is where the keep itself has been pretty overrun, and the evil guys are starting to really swamp in. Uh, they're trying to kind of pull back from the causeway and get themselves inside the keep. So we've kind of missed that whole major siege of the keep. We've just had the causeway and then falling back to the keep itself. Once again, the Uruks are just an unending wave. We've got some cool little special rules to represent the theme. Thaden and Gambling won't leave the board edge until Aragorn or Legolas has got back from the uh, from the gate because they're a bit deeper and they're trying to hold the orcs to, to let their friends get back. So some really cool stuff here. This is on a 2x2 two two board again. Super easy for you guys to build at home uh, and then we have you know the big famous moment ride out ride out and meet them head on uh, and we've uh, we've got uh, Aragorn, Legolas, Theoden, uh, Gamling and four Royal Guard charging down the causeway uh, to ride out and hack apart some Uruks. Now we've only got three Uruk captains and 20 Urukai in this scenario, so a bit of a smaller scale kind of conflict clustering around the base of the causeway, trying to stop them from, you know, doing their thing. Uh, so again, a very achievable scenario that captures kind of a, a microcosm of that movie uh, and uh, and that kind of big sort of, oh, the moment with the horn blowing, oh, spine tingling stuff. And then we have at first light on the fifth day, look to the east. I think I got that right. Aemer's return. Gandalf and Aemer rock up to come and kick some Uruk butt. Now this is a cool one. We've got Aemer and Urkenbrand, which is a cool inclusion. We've got Gandalf, 24 Riders of Rohan, and then three Urukai captains and 30 warriors. So this is going to be pretty savage. There's a whole lot of juicy kind of special rules to uh, reflect the charge and the, the big bright flare that Gandalf sets off called Look to the Sun, which is a rule that might come up a little bit later on, Cough Legendary Legion. We'll have a look at that later in the uh, in the game. Uh, and then basically the good player is just trying to kill 75% of the Uruks. So a big hack and slash on a 2x4 board so you can build yourselves a cool ravine coming all the way down. Now, nine scenarios for Helm's Deep so far. And now it's time for number 10. This is a big one. Uh, we've got something that is quite similar to one of the old Helm's Deep scenarios, where essentially you're playing in this big battle uh, and you're trying to score these different objectives after a certain amount of turns. It's actually quite similar to the way the big Pelennor Fields board was done. So the objectives that both sides are fighting for are keeping Theoden alive, control of the Deeping Wall, control of the Hornburg, uh, kind of how many of the good heroes in total are still alive, and then the Causeway itself. So five objectives that the sides are fighting over, and let's have a little look Look at the forces that are going to be involved in this massive conflict. For good, we've got Theoden. I mean, he's there. That makes sense. We've got Gamling. And then 25 Warriors of Rohan. Pretty big chunk. We've got Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Haldir, Haleth, one of the awesome new guys. Oh, I think Eldor, the other guy, was there somewhere as well. And then we have... How many is that? Another 25 Elven Warriors. So a fairly chunky good force. But surely there must be a large, overwhelming Uruk force to fight them. Let's have a look. Oh, we're not even done with the good. Now we have the relief force. We have Aema. We have Urkenbrand. We have Gandalf and 24 Riders of Rohan. The same components uh, from the scenarios we saw earlier. And now the Legions of Isengard. Five Urukai captains. One Siege Ballista. Five Demolition teams. 85 Urukai warriors. Uh, 16 Uruk Berserkers, and then 10 Siege Ladders, a smattering of banners, pikes, blades, all the things. That is a huge horde of Urukai. I'm going to be relying on everyone else's Urukai 
uh, for that scenario. I definitely don't have 85. So that is absolutely massive. There's a whole bunch of special rules. Obviously, AMO will arrive at some point. There's the ladders, you know, raising the ladders with the ballistas, knocking them down, blowing the walls open with the siege bombs. Lots of exciting stuff. That is going to be... I'm so building a Helm's Deep board. This is going to be amazing. Now, we finally move out of Helm's Deep. The campaign is still going. It's not over. We have the defense of Edoras, and this might be one of my favorite scenarios in the whole book. Jay, this is awesome. Now, for those of you who aren't super familiar, while we were all kind of kicking ass over with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli in Helm's Deep, Elfhelm was sent to defend Edoras, where it was attacked by Dunlendings. Uh, so, very good that they didn't have the foresight to protect the Golden Hall, and we've got a cool little siege here, which is going to be perfect for using our new Rohan terrain, which is probably why the scenario is in the book, and we've got Elfhelm, two captains of Rohan, 37 Rohan warriors, pretty big chunk there with some banners and things, and then we've got all the new uh, Dunlending heroes and a big horde of Dunlending warriors. 12 warriors, 12 wild men, and 12 wag riders, which is super cool. It kind of reminds me of the old Two Towers video game, uh, the level where Edoras got assaulted by orcs and stuff. Very, very cool. Super excited to play through that scenario. And then we've got how many in the main campaign? One, two three scenarios in the campaign left. We've got Last March of the Ents, some big, juicy, anti-Orthang action, uh, which shows off a few new profiles. For the Ents, we've got Treebeard, Pippin, Merry, Quickbeam, and Beachbones. Obviously, some new Ents have finally been released. Uh, we'll have a look at those when we get to the profile section. Uh, and we've got, yeah, a really cool board, Orthang in the middle, uh, and then, you know, they're trying to hack everything, they're trying to pull the pull the dam and flood Isengard, really really cool theme scenario, which is on a 4x4, so you could really go to town and build a cool Isengard scenario uh, if you wanted to. I remember some really nice guides uh, from the Two Towers Journey book, which will be helpful for you there. Then we have the Urukai Retreat. Now this is an interesting little scenario. Now, I was fairly hopeful that we would see some Huorns which are the kind of small, crazy trees uh, as like a lower cost unit. Now, obviously, if Games Workshop were to do that, they'd have to make models for them, which they're not really that keen on doing, I imagine. There's a lot to focus on. So we haven't got any Huon profiles. I can reveal that to you now. But in this scenario, we kind of get the feel of them. Uh, we've got three Ents as the forces for good, and then a bunch of Uruks as 20 uh, warriors and two captains. But then there's some really cool special rules about any time Uruks come within trees, uh, they, they take like strength three hits because that's like meant to represent the Huons. So we get a little bit of flavor of them here which is really exciting now the final scenario in the main kind of chunk of scenarios because we're still not done with narrative action is something way out of left field the pass of the druidan so this is all about uh when uh theoden and and the kind of Ered and and all of the the army of rohan are riding down to minas tirith and they get advised by uh gan burigan and the Wozes warriors that there is a huge horde of easterlings who have entrenched themselves on the main road from rohan down to gondor they've built big spiked fortifications which is going to neuter the rohan cavalry charge and basically rohan aren't going to make it to the pelinor fields, because Sauron knew they were coming, right? He's not an idiot. And Garn Burigan and the Wozes show them hidden paths through the valleys, which safely get them to Gondor and take Sauron totally by surprise. Now, the goal of this scenario is, of course, for us to navigate through the forest, get the Rohan forces off the board edge to try and get down to Gondor, and there's a smattering of evil orcs who are scouring and patrolling these forests uh, that are trying to stop us. And, of course, we've got Garn Burigan and the Wozes warriors to help us as well, so no one has ever running those except for like Timothy Huxon, I think. That's like a million of them. Good on you, Tim. You're a champ. But everyone else is going to start wanting them now for this scenario. So, uh, well done. Well done. Uh, they're going to be uh, very valuable now. Everyone's selling them on the second-hand market. But I think they got re-released as well. So there you go. We can buy them from GW. Very nice indeed. And that brings us to the end of the first set of scenarios for this incredible campaign. Once again, we've got another campaign linking them here, so if you play them in order, depending on like good or evil victories, you get effects in the following scenarios. For instance, in the Wag Attack, if good wins when you're playing the Raise the Ladders scenario, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli may re-roll a d6 when attempting to knock a ladder, or in uh, the evil scenario, Aragorn start if, if evil wins, Aragorn only starts with a single point of might, because he got messed up by Sharku. Uh, if we 
have a look at fall back to the keep, another one of the Helm's Deep scenarios. Uh, in the ride out scenario, if Good has won once per game, Theta may declare a heroic combat without spending might because he's managed to sort of get into the keep without getting all messed up. Whereas if Evil have won the fall back to the keep scenario during ride out once per game, the Evil player may choose to automatically gain priority instead of rolling for it. Very useful when trying to neuter the ride out uh, charging cavalry. So lots of kind of cool links that give little buffs really exciting stuff. Now that's the end of the scenarios for now and we're jumping into armies and this is a hugely exciting part of the book. Let's have a look. Up first we have Rohan. Do they need any more profiles? Apparently they do. We've got a couple. We have two profiles, Eldor and Harleth. Now these are the profiles that were reviewed experimentally and have been released already, those models. Uh, I don't have them yet, they're coming. Uh, and they're really cool. Essentially they're built around characters from Helm's Deep. We've got Eldar the old archer who accidentally fires the arrow. He's hitting on five so he's garbage but he rerolls hits and wounds which is pretty awesome and he always shoots first even before everybody even before heroic shoots I think yeah, even before Heroic Shoots resolve, which is pretty cool, because he accidentally lets go of the arrow. And that happens every turn, which is kind of insane. Uh, and then we have Harleth, son of Harma, uh, which is of course the son of the captain who gets his head bitten off by the Wargs. Uh, and he has some amazing synergies. He's only 5-3, strength 3, d4, so he's not great. He does have two wounds though, one might, one will, two fate. And he's only 30 points, he's a bargain. But, listen to this madness. Whilst within 6 inches of Aragorn, Harleth increases his attacks to 2. Cool, he's kind of useful now, that's pretty awesome. At the start of the fate fight phase, if Harleth is engaged in combat, for the duration of the turn, Aragorn and other friendly Rohan infantry within 6 inches gain 1 to their fight value. This benefit ends immediately if Harleth is, in, is slain. So let's break that down. Fight 7 Aragorn, it's about bloody time. That's amazing. But also, plus 1 fight value to the infantry in that bubble. But definitely a, a really crazy, really crazy little model. Especially for only 30 points as well. Yes, he's soft. Too fate though, he's not that soft. Crazy. Lothlorien have a page, but they don't actually have any more models. They're just kind of listed. To be honest, I don't really know why. I don't get the point of why this page has been included. Uh, maybe just to kind of advertise the army a little bit in case players have picked this book up and want to know a bit more about Lothlorien, but nothing extra for them there. And then we're diving into Fangorn. This details the army, uh, you know, the, the army bonus that we all know from the army book, but of course we have two new Ent profiles. We have Beachbone and Quickbeam. Now they're kind of nicely tooled to be a little bit different from Treebeard and give you some different options for your Ent army. They're both got access to the bludgeon special rule or special uh, brutal power attack uh, that uh, all the tree beards and ends have, uh, but they've got some different stats. We've got fight seven on one, fight eight on the other. They've both got a lot of might, wounds, uh, strength, defense. They're pretty insane, but they have uh, some kind of extra juice, particularly for Beachbone. He has deep rooted hatred. Now, for those of you who know the story, Beachbone uh, is kind of very scarred and, and messed up over some some pretty savage stuff that happened to his you know little area in Fangorn Forest. It got absolutely cut down and trashed. So he's pretty savage. Uh, Beachbone must re-roll all failed wound rolls when making strikes against Orc, Urukai, Goblin, or Isengard models, which also applies to some men, which we'll find out later on. In addition, Beachbone must always charge an enemy of those same types if able to do so, which is pretty cool. Uh, really themey, so really excited to finally see a bit more variety for the Ents. No Huons, unfortunately, which means no kind of cheaper cost units, so you're still going to be a bit stuck on how to run that. Uh, but, you know, that's okay. Uh, it's, yeah, it, I'm still, I'm just happy to see the new heroes. Don't know if we'll get models for them. It might just be, you know, use Ent kits and make conversions. Maybe we'll get models. We don't know. Up next, we have Isengard. Now, this is where we kind of hit my, I suppose, my biggest qualm with this book. Um, obviously, you know, apart from the Fords of Eisen thing, that's not really a big deal. This is a big deal, and it's kind of a uh, hugely missed opportunity. Let's have a look at the positives first. We have a new profile called Snaga, which is another orc captain. Um, he's kind of themed around one of the orcs who was there uh, during the kind of um, the, the scout party that Uglux's leading that gets messed up by Aimer and the Rohirrim. Uh, he's a servant of Mordor, uh, even though he has the Isengard keyword. No, he doesn't. He only has the Mordor keyword, and he can only lead orcs. Uh, and then he has a really cool special rule called Cunning Mind, which is he can choose 
not to take part in, in allied heroic actions um, and then still move later on, uh, like, you know, if they call with me in a heroic move, and if he does take part in, a, in an allied heroes with me, he doesn't have to stay within six inches, which is pretty cool. He can do some crazy little shenanigans. So, very cool there. And that's it. No more named Isengard heroes. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. I love Isengard. It's an awesome list. It's a, it's a fantastic faction. But they have a problem that they don't have a big hitting hero. Uh, there's always, you know, too much burden is put on Lurtz. He's a great hero, but also all of the named heroes are scout heroes. Uh, so there's no kind of big juicy named captain themed around the Helm's Deep forces. Uh, there's no kind of big juicy character. I was really hoping for either that Captain on the Rock to get a profile, we might see him later on, which we'll have a look in a sec, or to have a Berserker hero who's really tanky, has some really big flash damage to represent the Berserker that killed Haldir. The Isengard list has a problem. Uh, it's got, you know, amazing troops, amazing mid-level heroes, and lots of them, but no big guys. It struggles to deal with Gilgalad and Glorfindel. You've got to try and use Sauron to... Sauron. You've got to try and use Saruman to kind of leverage control and, and kind of use all of your mid-range heroes and really great troops to kind of counter these big heroes. But sometimes Glorfindel and Elrond and all the, you know, Saurons and Gilgalads, they just mess up your day and you don't have a big hero of dealing with them. Uh, even a big hero to deal with them. Even Aragorn is a problem for Isengard a lot of the time, so even Aragorn. You know, Aragorn's amazing, but it's, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm really disappointed that Isengard didn't get another named hero, so that if you wanted to take named heroes, you didn't only have scout, Urukai scout heroes as your options. Bit disappointing, uh, and I think this was the only opportunity we're ever going to see it, so I don't think we'll see it now. Hugely disappointing. Now, we're swinging from hugely disappointing to absolutely amazing as we jump in to Dunland. Now, everyone said I was crazy when I called huge things for Dunland. I called Huskarls, I called Cavalry, I called all sorts of juicy new heroes, even the dude who cuts his arm and makes an oath and shit, and it is all here, ladies and gentlemen. Let's have a look. We have three new named Dunland heroes. None of them are mounted, so keeping that foot theme, Thryden is still the only mounted hero. Up first, we have Gorulf Ironskin. He's 70 points, three might, a big juicy captain. He's fight five, man. More fight five heroes for Dunland, which is crazy. He's strength five, D5. He's got access to heroic strike. Basically, he's a big kind of choppy dude. Three attacks, only the two two wounds and one fate, so definitely soft, but here's where he gets really cool. Iron Skin, at the start of the fight phase, if Gorof is engaged with an enemy hero, he can call a heroic defense without spending might. That is so cool. Massive, massive. Really, really like this profile. He's got an armor and two axes, which is represented by his three attacks. Really, really cool model. Got access to heroic strike and defense normally, uh, as well as strength, so lots of cool stuff here. Then we have um, the next one, Frida Tallspear. Now, again, her model's been released. We can, or what her model was at Throne of Skulls and will be released soon. So we know these guys are all getting models. Now, she's cool. I think she's actually a bit too cool. She's fight five, which is ridiculous. She shouldn't be. Uh, she's strength four, defense six, two attacks, two wounds. Uh, and she's three might as well. So again, two wounds, one fate, a little bit soft. Uh, she's got heroic defense though. She's got heroic strength. But listen to this, and I'm so happy this rule is here. I knew they'd give it to somebody. We've got cavalry models, do not gain extra attack and knock to the ground in uh, when fighting against her or in fights in which she is supporting. She has a spear, which is awesome. Uh, and she also has a, an ability called go for the horse. Friendly Tall Spear, Friendly Tall Spear, Frida Tall Spear, and, uh, and friendly Dunlanding models within three inches of her may reroll wounds against mounts during the fight phase. She's like an, a hugely anti Rohan, anti horse hero. I love the theme. And then the third one is so cool. I'm so glad it's happened. The Wild Man Oathmaker. I said we needed another Wild Man uh, profile, that kind of spy kind of character. We've got the, the oath making, hand cutting character. Uh, and he's, he's just basically a little captain. He's got three miles. Really kind of soft, 5-4, strength 4, d4. Strength 4 is pretty good, but uh, de definitely that d4. And and uh, and it's all about the special rules with the wild man Oathmaker. We will die for Saruman! All wild men of Dunland included in the same army as the Oathmaker gain the Isengard keyword for the duration of the battle. That is huge! That means the wild men will be affected 
by the Isengard bonus, which allows them to not start rolling courage tests until 33% of the models are remaining rather than less than 50 when they're broken. Massive. And then we have Blood Oath. Uh, friendly men of Dunlin within six inches of this lad are fearless. Awesome. Such cool synergies. I love it. Now, let's jump into the troops. We've got two new profiles to look at troop-wise. Dunlending Horsemen. Uh, the Horsemen are pretty trash, to be honest. They're 12 points, which is great because they're cheap. But they're just like, you know, they're three. Uh, they're... Strength 5, 3, Strength 4, Defense 5, 1 attack. They're not that great. They do have a special rule that uh, means they re-roll 1s when wounding against other horses, which is kind of cool. But it's the, the fact that their profile isn't amazing, it doesn't matter because the fact that Dunland now have access to cavalry makes them really valuable. So definitely a great profile there. And then the final thing that we have is the Dunlending Huskarl, uh, which as I predicted is just like a nice kind of elite fighting troop, the kind of more uh, upper cadre of the Dunlending Warriors. They've got um, fight three, but uh, when they're supporting within three inches of a friendly Dunlending hero, any hero, they gain plus one fight. So it'll give you some fight four in the Dunlending Horde. Um, uh, otherwise, they're pretty much uh, warriors, the, the normal warriors, but they also have bodyguard. So very much the Dunlending Royal Guard kind of vibe. Now that's the end of the Dunlending forces, but we also have a secret one that has surprised us. We have Creebane, Creebane of Dunland. They're the, you know, the birds, the ravens, Saruman spies, and they are fight two, strength two, defense three, two attacks, four wounds. It's pretty cool, only 20 points. Uh, they've got fly, so 12 inch move, leaping all over the place because they're birds. Uh, and they, uh, enemy models within 12 inches of one or more Creebine cannot use the stalk unseen special rule. Very cool indeed. So, that brings us to the end of the Dunland section. Or does it? There's a new Dunland Battle Company! Dunland has been updated because, of course, there are so many new units, uh, which is super cool. And man, I might actually run Dunland now in, in Season 2 of Battle Companies. I, I love the faction, um, but the, the whole bloody Battle Company was so awful. Uh, so, we've got two Dunlanding Warriors uh, with shield, one with two-handed axe, one with bow, and four wild men as the starting faction. Uh, advancements, wild men turn into warriors, and then we've got some gorgeous reinforcements. We've just got uh, wild men and warriors on the first chart, roll a six to get to the special chart, and then we have Dunlanding Huskulls, Dunlanding Horsemen, and Kraybine on rare two. Uh, so, really cool, uh, and, and they still have the Frenzied Fighter special rule, so when they take wounds, they're heroes uh, on a 5 plus they can ignore it. So awesome to see Jay. Thank you so much for including that in this book as well. Awesome idea dude. Well done. Really love your work. Now that's the end of our faction updates. It's time for the Legendary Legions. This video is so long. There is so much in this book. Oh my god, let's 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 get into it. So, legendary legions, we all know what they are. They're amazing themey representations uh, of of specific moments that allow you to take specific lists that are constrained in some way, but give you access to really cool bonuses or allow you to take units that wouldn't normally be allied together. Up first, we have the Defenders of Helm's Deep. This is themed all around, uh, you know, everyone who was on the battlements defending Helm's Deep. Funnily enough, we've got Elves, we've got Rohan, we've got Eldor, we've got Harleth, the new profiles. Uh, it's, yeah, a, a really nice, versatile group, and it's all on foot. So, here we have, as Loki was hoping, some really viable ways to take on foot Rohan. Let's have a quick look through the special rules. Uh, basically, everyone has to have the infantry keyword. Uh, um, you have to take, at maximum, you can take 33% Lothlorien, so you've got to have a lot of Rohan in there. Uh, we have fight in the ranks. Rohan models with throwing spears can use their spears as normal spears, as long as they haven't thrown them that turn. We have supporting in a Rohan army. Amazing. Give them a volley. Models in this, uh, in this legendary legion that have a bow uh, increase their range from 24 inches to 30 inches, provided they haven't moved that turn. Maxing out the shooting, of course, representing the superior bow fire from that elevated position on the walls. And then the final special rule is fall back to the keep. If this force is broken, then warrior models add one to their courage value. Additionally, if this force is broken, friendly warrior models may re-roll failed courage tests if they are within six inches of Theoden. Really cool, Theoden's rallying the troops, trying to save them all, and, 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 you know, make them fall back to the keep. So very cool indeed. Now, 
There was one particular legendary legion that I was not going to be happy if it was not included, and that is a Fords of Isaac. And yeah, I mean, basically all my, all my like you know thing. It's all about Fords of Isaac for me, apparently. And I'm so excited. Theodred's Guard has been included. This is an awesomely themey legendary legion, all about the forces that were there at the Fords of Isaac. Let's have a look. Obviously, we've got Theodred, Elfhelm, Grimbold, captains, and all the troops, warriors, royal guard, riders, and outriders. No Urken brand which kind of annoys me a bit. I, in my kind of proposed Legendary Legion, I had that you could take uh, Theodred or Urkenbrand because obviously uh, they weren't there at the same time, but Urkenbrand did make it to the Fords. He just didn't hang about for very long, gathered some troops and fell back. But he was there in the conclusion of, of the, the, the second battle of the Fords. But I understand that they've just decided to focus on the main bulk, so that's okay. Uh, you have to include Theodred, obviously. Um, everyone in the Force gets Sworn Protector Theodred, which essentially grants them the Bodyguard special rules specifically to that hero. Uh, Riders of Theodred. Now this is a great rule. Essentially, everyone in the army that has the Riders of Theoden special rule, which is the Royal Guard and the uh, the Riders of Rohan, they get plus one to their fight value on a turn in which they've charged. If they're within 12 inches of Theoden and they've mounted, that now applies to Theodred. Very, very cool. Absolutely love that. And then fight in ranks. They also have the Spear rule, which is really cool. Now, uh, one thing I sort of was... I predicted in my Legendary Legion was like giving them shield wall, effectively the same kind of themey thing can be said with the spear support, so I'm totally in love with that. I just wish there was a bit more of a themey relationship between Grimbold and Theodred. I had like that whole kind of free heroic combat synergy which you guys can check out in, in my predictions video. So that would be the one thing that I'd say is missing, but this is certainly an awesome list. Um, it's definitely competitive. Is it as good as the Rise of Theoden? No, frankly, but it's still really good uh, and, and I love the theme. So definitely something I'm going to be considering playing, um, but yeah, oh, su such a good list. All right, we're still kicking on in Rohan land and now we're into the Riders of Aema, a third way to play Rohan that isn't the Riders of Theoden. What have we got here? We've got Aema, we've got Urkenbrand, here he is, and we've got Gandalf on Shadowfax. Everyone in this army is mounted and all you can take are captains or riders of Rohan, no royal guards. This is all about, you know, Aema's relief force. Uh, the special rules are to the king. Uh, Rohan cavalry within 12 inches of Aema get plus one to their strength on a turn in which they charge. So, kind of neutering the whole uh, board wide effect of the army bonus and concentrating it down to an Aema sized bubble of 12 inches. Uh, is that necessary? We'll have a look. And then the final special rule is look to the sun. Once per battle, so long as Gandalf is alive and in your force, you can declare that you are using this ability at the start of your friendly move phase. Until the end of turn, enemy models that you are engaged with or supporting a model that you are engaged with um, that a, uh, a charge with a, a cavalry model and that's important suffer minus one to their dual rolls that is huge every fight that's happening board wide that has a cavalry model that you charged you have to charge everyone else in the fight gets minus one supporting or in combat that's massive. Obviously, it's a one-turn effect. It's sort of like the equivalent of death in this army. Is it as powerful as death? Probably not. Still pretty good, though. Um, on the whole, I, I really like I really like this um, this legendary legion. Obviously, riders of Rohan still don't count towards the bow limit, so it's very themey. Um, you get basically big rider spam, and you and your three heroes there, maybe a captain. Really cool. I I, do, I think it's. I think they didn't need to make the 12 inch bubble on the plus one strength of the charge. I know you've got Gandalf there and having Gandalf and Aima together, that's gonna be pretty powerful. And that special rule, Look to the Sun, is awesome. But basically the, the kind of benchmark that I hold all legendary legions to is the Riders of Theoden and, and in terms of my own competitive gaming, I'm never gonna not take the Riders of Theoden instead of that. So um, I, I, I feel like that was an unnecessary sort of elevation that made it slightly less competitive, but it's still awesome. Wizards, spells, Awesome cab and a cool special rule. I love it. I love it. Now, another legendary legion that I was not expecting, the Paths of Druidan. So this is a Wozes and like Army of Rohan themed army. We've got Theoden, Aemer, Durnhelm, Deowine, Elfhelm, Gamling, and Garn Burigan as the named heroes. And then all the Rohan Cav models and the Wozes Warriors. This is of course representing the Rohan force that sneaks through the forest on the way to the Pelennor Fields. Um, yeah, super, super cool theme and kind of surprising to be honest. A another a great option to see more Wozes on the battlefield. We don't see them enough. Let's have a look at their special rules. Um, 
Uh, you have to include Garn Burrigan, you have to include Theoden, and only Garn Burrigan can lead Woza's Warriors. You can't sprinkle them through the army. Um, the same thing, riders don't count to your bow limit. Uh, and then you've got a couple of really interesting special rules. At the start of the game, before either side is deployed, the Legendary Legion's controlling player may place three 25mm waypoint markers anywhere on the board. Whilst within six inches of a friendly waypoint marker, Rohan models do not suffer any penalties for moving or charging through difficult terrain. So if you're playing all Rohan and you come up on a crazy forest board, you can just be like, those woods don't count, those woods don't count, those woods don't count. Very, very cool. I love that. Super themey. Kill all orc folk. Everyone in the army gets to reroll ones uh, against orc goblins or urukai. Very cool. And then know all paths. This is mental. Okay, so during the move phase, if models from both sides have declared a heroic move and you have to go to a roll-off, it goes, it's like an elven blade for the heroic roll-off, right? So if you're playing as the good, you will get the roll-off on three, four, five, six. Or if you're the lowest, one, two, three, four. So, you know, you're, you're, you're heroic moving all the time with Rohan because you want the charge. So that is absolutely massive because, you know, the Garn Burrigan, no more paths. They're giving you the secret routes. So, you know, you've got a bit more, I don't know, initiative. It's, yeah, really cool. I really like it. Great Legendary Legion. Now, we're into the evil forces. We've got one, two, Two, three, four, four here. Let's have a look. Up first, Uglux Scouts. Super happy this is in here. Basically, this is like the Uber Scout list. Everyone's been playing this list anyway, and now it's even better. Only Orc heroes can lead Orc warriors. Only Urukai he heroes can lead Urukai warriors, of course. The Uruks we have are Ugluk, Mahor, uh, and a captain. And then we've got Grishnak and Snaga and a captain from the Orcs. We've got Orc warriors, Urukai warriors, uh, obviously Urukai scouts. Uh, and you can also take an Urukai drummer, which is very cool. Uh, there, we've got three special rules here. The pace has quickened. If your army includes Mahor, then Urukai scouts in your force may be upgraded to Marauders rather than just the ones in Mahor's warband. So the Marauders is now army-wide. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, however, it doesn't cost anything. It's free. So uh, you get to, you know, go up to eight inches. Additionally, Ugla, Urukai scout captains, and Urukai drummers increase their move to eight inches. So your entire Urukai force is moving eight inches for free. Amazing. Then we have Make Haste to Isengard. Everyone gains Woodland Creature. Oh my god. Like, everyone, not just the Isengarders. And then we have Animosity. My favourite rule from this Legendary Legion, which is... Friendly Orc models gain plus one to wound in the fight phase if they're involved in the same fight as an Urukai model, and Urukai gain plus one to wound if they're involved in the same fight as an Orc model. Amazing. Has to be best to base, doesn't count supports, but still really cool theme list. Obviously the Uruks are going to be running off and leaving the Orcs behind, so it might not happen all the time, but once they get in combat together, uh, going to be, yeah, really, really powerful. Love that list. Up next we have the Wolves of Isengard. This is a really cool legendary legion. We've got Shaku, heaps of wags, you can take a shaman on a wag and wild wags as well and that's about it. There's some really great uh, kind of special rules to make this competitive because it's kind of not purely on paper. Shaku can declare a heroic combat each turn for free amazing uh, and ambush in scenarios where maelstrom of battle is used um, you can automatically choose to win or lose priority on the first turn and when you do come in you can charge unlike normal, which is absolutely insane. Um, yeah, re really love that. And then the final special rule is called Scouts. Now this is very, very similar to my obscure scouting special rule that I predicted, um, but Jay has made some clever changes, or had this idea all on his own, uh, where D6 of your warrior models uh, at the beginning of the game uh, can be selected as Scouts. They immediately make a move and a shoot, which is awesome. Uh, but they can't charge, they can't move within one inches of uh, enemy models. Um, and, you know, during Maelstrom of Battle, they can also, like, come on and do their move and, and all that sort of thing. So, you know, it's really cool. Represents the scouts being sent out ahead of the wild pack. Really love this list. We're definitely going to see it. Everyone loves running doggos, so definitely going to see some stuff here. Then we have uh, the second last evil legendary legion, the Assault on Helm's Deep. Now this is, as I predicted, all about the theme of the, the assaulting army, and this is where they try to kind of nerf the fact, or kind of rebalance the fact that there's not that big Uruk hero, because obviously there's no named heroes at Helm's Deep. So let's have a look. 
You do not know pain, you do not know fear. The same Isengard bonus. Uh, you don't take courage tests for being broken until 60% of you are dead, 66%. The commander of the Urukai, the Urukai captain chosen as your leader, increases their wounds and attacks to three each. So that's the way they've kind of tried to leverage, you know, giving you that kind of extra hard hitting hero. Urukai captains are amazing, only two mites. Mm, yeah, not enough, not enough. No access to Heroic Strike in the whole army. Mm, yeah, not enough. Um, the only models that you have are Urukai Captains, Urukai Shamans, Warriors, Demo Teams, Berserkers, Ballistas, and Trolls, which is an interesting inclusion. Um, hero models from this force can increase the number of models they can lead in their warband by six, so you can really hoard out, which I think is a very cool way of representing the idea I had of trying to capture their numbers by having them have uh, unrelenting hoard, so I really like that rule, good work. Uh, and then we have Break the Walls, this is big. Basically. Isengard Ballista from this army reroll hits and the scatter table during the shoot phase. Very similar uh, to like the Gothmogs, uh, you know, the Mortal War Catapult with the Troll. Um, yeah, and those things can be absolutely crazy. Also, whenever a demo charge from your army is detonated, you roll two dice rather than one and pick either result. Very cool. Now, is this competitive enough? No, frankly. Um, it's cool, but like, yeah. They're missing that big hero. All they've got is captains. They've got two might on the captains. They've got no heroic strike. A big hero is just going to carve this army apart. You've got to use, I guess, demo charges. You've got to use your ballistas. Yeah, it's a shame. They needed a berserker hero, in my opinion. But I'm still glad to see it here, and it's themey, and people will love it. Uh, but it does bum me out that they missed out. I mean, at least it's three attacks on three wounds, but it's just not enough. You need heroic strike. Simple as that. The next one is amazing, the Army of Dunland. Not only have we had amazing new Dunland profiles, now we get an incredible Legendary Legion. Listen to this. Who have we got? Thryden, Gorol, Frida, the Oathmaker, obviously. Dunlanding Chieftains, Warriors, Wildmen, Horsemen, Huskarls. Makes sense. Uh, you have to include Thryden, which I love. I love that they force that. Thryden's awesome. And he's a hero of Valor, so we can lead 15 people. Death to the Forgoyle, which is Dunlending for Rohan. Friendly Dunlending models gain the Hatred Rohan special rule. Plus one to wound against Rohan forces. Cannot wait to fight some Dunlendings now. Dunlending Pride. This is insane. Dunlending banners are increased to range 6. Right now, Kylie is like screaming. Range 6 banners is... So awesome, so good, I love it. It's, it's ridiculously overpowered, but I feel like it's not because it's Dunland, so I love that. I really love that, it's fantastic. It will really help leverage the higher fight value of the new units, like the Huskarls, so very, very cool. Then the final one, and this is awesome, Dunlending Warcry. Once per game, it's basically death, you know it's coming. At the start of any fight phase, Thryden can declare that he is using this ability until the end of turn, friendly Dunlanding wounds within 12 inches of Thryden gain a bonus of plus one to wound. We have to play a Dunland right as a Thayden matchup. Imagine like, Thayden calls death, Thryden calls Dunlanding war cry. Uh, that means against Rohan models, they're getting plus two to wound, I'm getting three heroic combats. Oh man, this army's awesome. We're gonna see like a billion Dunland armies now. Super, super, super happy. All right, so that's the end of the Legendary Legions for now. And now we're into sieges. We've got some extra siege rules, which is really funny because just the other day we were playing a game uh, and we were trying to like work out how to break through a door and we couldn't find like the, the old table that listed the defense values and batter points or now wounds. Uh, and now it is back in the war in Rohan Supplement. We have rules for sieges. So we've got, you know, attacking gates and doors. We've got defender equipment and attacker's equipment. Extra equipment that you can take for points for use in siege matches. We have rallying points, uh, which allow you to get plus one courage within six inches of them. There's barricades that you can buy and put down. There are spiked barricades, which is when you're fighting over them and the attacker hits the barricade instead of hitting you in combat. They take a strength three hit, which is super cool. Uh, there's rocks, there's boiling oil that you can pour on people to give people awful or boiling burns and deal some damage. The attackers have some equipment as well. Obviously siege towers, siege ladders and banner Rams. Really cool stuff. Now, when are we going to play these scenarios? In the new siege scenarios, of course. We have the Grand Siege and Defend the Village. Two kind of siege formats, uh, all about, you know, basically, look, to be honest, 
These are really matched play scenarios. They're not listed as such, but they could work perfectly. You could run a tournament all about sieges where armies build attackers and defenders armies. And I know this has been a huge kind of passion of Rob Alderman's for a long time. He loves siege games and he's never been uh, kind of thrilled with how sieges aren't enough seen and aren't enough seen aren't seen enough and and aren't kind of like a bigger part of the hobby so uh well done rob you got your baby in the book and it's awesome and i'm super stoked these scenarios will look really cool we've got you know like the kind of big fortifications versus kind of defended village kind of vibe uh which is really really cool obviously you don't have to include these in tournaments they're completely optional but if uh if tos want to deck themselves out with sieging equipment uh you could run a really cool siege event in these as well now uh speaking of buildings and rohan stuff we've obviously seen all of these but we've got some detailed uh, kind of uh, terrain guides uh, talking about getting them built getting them painted uh, you know showing all the kind of little extra details so there's a really nice painting guide uh, in here as well and then a bit of a showcase on some different building designs that you can do which is really helpful because it helps sort of broaden your mind so I would recommend to anyone before they uh, dive in and, and touch these kits to have a flick through here as well as looking at the Warhammer Community article and the future articles that are going to be coming out with more details. And then we have the big juicy Rohan settlement that I showed you guys earlier, uh, which is of course uh, from the Warhammer Community post from the Warhammer World building team. So uh, it's a really nice diorama to get you super excited and motivated there with some lovely shots there. Nice big colour stuff. Now we have one of the biggest moments in the book. Well, there's been a billion big ones, but... Here we have the appendix. Now if you guys remember the Shire appendix, that's where we got a new big hero. We had, uh, what's his name? Golfimble? Golfimble. Well, oh, I don't remember Golfimble's name. I love Golfimble. And here we have a new profile for Rohan. Helm Hammerhand. Now, this is huge. The profile's awesome, but it is drastically overcosted. And there's a reason for that, which we'll find out in a few more pages. Ledger of Legion. <clears throat> so, Helm Hammerhand, he's 165 points. That's big. That's expensive. Let's see what he does. Fight 5, big disappointment. Why is he Fight 5? The Rohan hero being Fight 5 forever. Nah, kills me. Strength 5, awesome. D7, 3 might, 3 will, 1 fate, 3 wounds. So, a little soft with the lack of fate, but D7's great. We love D7. Helm Hammerhand. This is a Warhorn, or the, the Horn of Hammerhand. This is a Warhorn. Additionally, in a turn in which Helm uh, charges into combat, he causes terror. Terror on the charge every turn. Amazing. He's got a two-handed sword and the horn, and he is burly. Incredible. Friendly Rohan warriors uh, within six inches get plus one to their fight value. So that's fight five Royal Guard, whether they're on foot or mounted. Amazing. And then we have the hammer hand. Listen to this shit. The helm, ha helm hammer hand may choose to fight with his fists instead of his sword, in which case he may use the bash special strike. Additionally, he never counts as unarmed. For those of you who know the story of Helm, he used to strangle Dunlendings with his bare hands, pretty much for fun. Uh, he must be taken, or he may be taken as part of a Rohan army list, but if you contain Helm and any other named heroes, uh, uh, you've got, you know, impossible alliances. Basically, don't take Helm and Thaden, is, is, the, is the gist. Otherwise, uh, you're jumping into Red Alliance land. He's got access to some great heroic actions, strike, strength, defense, challenge, and resolve, which is very interesting. Courage 6, which is pretty meaty as well. He's a pretty brave dude, and he can also take a horse. The other thing that's really interesting, oh, there's no photo, so I guess we're not getting a model. But wait, there he is right there. Wait, no, not that page. Hang on. We'll get to it. There's definitely a model. There's definitely a model. Now, uh, the appendix continues, we jump back in time even more, the Field of Calibran. We have a scenario around the birth of Rohan with Earl the Young, uh, leading uh, the Rohavian, Ro Rohavanian warriors down from the Vales of the Anduin, uh, and, uh, and kind of kicking some uh, butt, some Karnish butt in this case, uh, and the, the Karn warriors are here to represent the Wayne Riders, which was a force of 
kind of eastern dudes, Easterlings and Khan and all sorts of mixed up together. Uh, so we've got a really cool little scenario here. Uh, and then we have another Assault on Edoras scenario, which is really interesting. And this is all about uh, basically Dunlendings attacking Edoras. Just kind of a nice excuse uh, to use these beautiful buildings uh, and have another really nice siege and have a, like, a, you know, a big Dunland on, uh, a big Dunland on Rohan battle, which will be really cool as well. Lots of special rules, lots of really good stuff. Then we have the final scenario of the book, the Burn of Helm's Deep. This is a Helm Hammerhand scenario all about the famous battle where the Dunlendings lay siege uh, to Helm's Deep and uh, the defenders were like struck down by famine and uh, Helm was basically holding the fortress single-handedly and sneaking out at night and murdering the Dunlendings in their beds. Lots of really scary stuff. He's a scary dude. Uh, uh, so yeah, lots of juicy special rules. And then we have the final page of the book, Helm's Guard. And this is where Helm truly becomes fairly costed. So, this is a legendary legion. You can take Helm Hammerhand, Captains, the King Huntsman, which is important, Warriors, Riders, Royal Guard, and Outriders. Now, the force has to include Helm's Hammerhand, and let's have a listen to these special rules. Defend the Soothberg. Friendly Rohan infantry models armed with throwing spears may use them as standard spears. We have another foot infantry viable Rohan force here. And then the final rule is the King of Rohan. Helm Hammerhand gains the Mighty Hero Special Rule. Additionally, Helm Hammerhand may declare a heroic combat each turn without spending might. So, Mighty Hero is the same rule that Earl the Young has, which gives him, every time he spends a point of might on a 4+, plus, that might is not expended. On top of that, he's also getting a free heroic combat each turn. That makes him worth 165 points. That is awesome. The only thing I'm disappointed about in this list in this uh, Legion is that there's no Sons of Earl. I think it really could have been a good opportunity to cram them in so that we could see a little bit more use. Uh, also, there's no Legendary Legion for Earl the Young. He's only seen in a scenario, which basically means we will never see Earl the Young in match play. And I was really hoping we'd get a Legendary Legion that sort of facilitated him, but I didn't see the Helm Hammerhand one coming. Well, not really. So um, I'm, I'm pretty stoked on that. Uh, but basically I've got like 15 Sons of Earl that I was really hoping I'd find a way to use and that's not gonna happen now uh, Especially as there's only six needed for the scenario, but Amazing to see that legendary legion there and what an incredible supplement. I'm So happy. Yes, the Fords of Eisen isn't as big as I want, whatever. I'll write my own scenarios. Yes, Isengard got screwed again um, but overall, the book is amazing. The campaign is fantastic. The narrative scenarios are incredibly well written. I think that's where Jay really shines. He's really showing his chops, uh, writing all these great scenarios, drawing on historical scenarios as well, but also bringing up some amazing new stuff, new special rules, new mechanics. The legendary legions are insane, dude. They're so great, well done. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a kind of mechanic, and they've continued to be fantastic in War and Rohan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy for Dunland. I'm so happy for us. Look at all this terrain. Ah, uh, a pretty good haul, I'd say. So, let's talk about what's coming out in the future. Obviously, the Dunlanding models need to go onto public release. Uh, but the other big thing we haven't talked about is Aema. We really don't have to keep using that awful Aema model, do we? I imagine that the Knight of the Palinor is going to be re-released or go on made to order, or down the track we are still going to get a plastic AMA sculpt. It hasn't been announced yet, but it might still happen. We'll have to wait and see. You know, we had Dernhelm kind of come out of nowhere three months or two months after Gondor at War. Obviously, she did have a profile, so that was kind of the thing. Will we get models for the Ents? I don't think so, but we might. Uh, probably not, though. I think you should just use the normal Ent models and convert them up. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, all, all the Dunland heroes. We've seen the new models come out for the Rohan, two new Rohan profiles, Eldor. Oh, of course, Helm Hammerhand. Right, so there's absolutely photos of the Helm Hammerhand model in here. You can see the foot version, you can see the mounted version. It's not a conversion, it's a model. It's Forge World. You can tell by the way that uh, the horse armor is sculpted. It's identical to Elf Helms, but it's definitely not the same army. Oh, here we go. So in the Helm's Guard Legendary Legion, you can quite clearly see this 
awesome model. The horse is in a great pose. Helm's got an awesome beard. It's custom armor. It's absolutely 100% a model. And I would bet my house that I don't own because I'm renting that it's going to be released. So um, yeah, definitely I reckon there'll be a Helm a Helm a Hammerhand model. But yeah, overall. Amazing, amazing supplement. What did you guys think? What are you most excited about? Do you like the Legendary Legions? Do you wish Isengard got a bigger named hero? Are you excited to see these terrain kits in action? Let me know what you think. You know, fire away in the comments any kind of discussion. I'll jump on in and have a chat and let you guys know my thoughts. Obviously, yes, we are heralding the beginning of so much war in Rohan content. And this isn't going to be like Gondor at War where we get seven scenarios in. It, we will finish that, but... We have this like so planned, we're so ready. Uh, all the models are painted, ready to go. Jacques from Rogers Paintworks has been getting them all ready for us. It's gonna be absolutely amazing. They're all sitting over there and they look so good. Obviously all this terrain is here. We're gonna crack on with that really quickly and start diving into the scenarios. We're gonna have some Helm's Deep stuff coming out soon. Uh, it's gonna be awesome. But not just that, we're gonna do, you know, terrain tutorials, painting tutorials for all the new movies. It's basically, all the new movies, all the new models. It's basically going to be War in Rohan City here on Zorp Zorp for quite some time. Very exciting stuff. Uh, if that isn't your cup of tea, I don't know why it wouldn't be. Don't stress, i got a whole lot of really cool content backed up as well. Uh, we've got some uh, battle companies to finish off. We've got a big final match as well as a few more extra matches. Uh, there's lots of really great games that I filmed down in, in Melbourne with a few extra secret collaborators who I can't wait to reveal. A couple of awesome Hobbit-themed battle reports, actually, with some good Gundabad and some dwarves. Those of you who know which Melbourneian might like Gundabad are probably knowing who I'm talking about. Uh, we've got some, yeah, really, really great content coming out, but War in Rohan is so exciting. Now, thank you so much for watching. I'm going to jump upstairs and edit this video as fast as I can so I can get this guy uh, all out to you before you guys pick up your stuff on Saturday. So hopefully uh, you're seeing this, you know, Thursday morning or Wednesday night. We'll see how late I stay up tonight to get it done. But yeah, again, a big thank you to the guys at Games Workshop for sending this stuff all out to me early so that I can get it reviewed and start getting it all made for you guys and doing some tutorials so I can have those videos ready for when you guys get your own kits. Um, yeah, I'm really keen to do maybe like a tutorial on the buildings using some airbrushing as well as some traditional techniques. Um, yeah, some really cool stuff and we really want to show the versatility of these kits off and, and, and give you some really nice guides on how to build them in different ways. So, amazing work. I'm, yeah, this is, yeah, what an amazing time to be playing a hobby, hey? This is absolutely next level. And there's even some gossip about uh, the next supplement or the next big supplement on the horizon. But we might save that for a future predictions video. The rumor mills are turning. All my little squirrels, all my little birds are bringing me the secrets and there is some pretty exciting stuff happening uh, down in the in the underworlds. Yeah, ooh, ooh, I want to talk about it, but I'm not allowed to, not yet. So, uh, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you hit the comments up, subscribe if you're new around here. If you haven't checked out our Patreon, now is an amazing time to do so. Oh yes, let's talk about the live stream. So, before I go, um, the Middle Earth Battle Games of Middle Earth live stream is about to kick off. I reckon I'm going to get it ready for next Monday. I've got all the equipment here. I'm almost finished building the live stream studio. Uh, I'll do an announcement video to give you guys the details. But if you haven't pledged to Patreon and you want to get on board uh, because all our Patreons receive these kind of uh, sponsored giveaways, basically, uh, as I play through the campaign on the live stream, you guys will be uh, randomly allocated. Some of the Patreons will be randomly allocated uh, whatever models I'm working on in that week, and they will become their models that they get to watch, kind of fight their way through the campaign, uh, and then eventually I will post them out to them free of charge. So they'll all be done up with some you know beautiful little names on the bases, and just really, really nice. It's going to be really cool. A great way to uh, reward my Patreons for your support because that's, it's, yeah, I mean, all of this couldn't be happening without you guys and without everyone who's just watching the videos or sharing them or liking or uh, chatting on our Zorpa Zorp community Facebook page. Uh, yeah, it's it's phenomenal to have your support and it's, it's really taken off, which is super exciting. So, hopefully the live stream will be coming out next Monday. I'll upload a video with specific details before that, just so you know. Uh, this Warren Rohan stuff might set me back a week, but I'm definitely going to get the first one up in December before Christmas. Because, uh, yeah, all, all the gear is... Oh, it's so exciting. I can't wait to do the live stream. You guys are going to be blown away, I reckon. It's going to be so much fun. So, yes, yeah, subscribe if you're new around here. Check out our Patreon if you want to support the channel. Uh, and thank you so much for watching. This is probably the longest outro ever. I will see you guys very soon, right here on Zorpa Zorp Gaming. Cheers. ...replica, uh, and there's lots and lots of juicy components. 
Why do I keep saying juicy so much? Ugh, it is hot today. Jesus Christ. My God, it's so hot. Of existing procket, prockets, prockets. Welcome to Zorbazor Gaming. That's gonna fuck me off so much. She's staying there.